Hello, this is Anna from Madame So. Today we're going to talk about pressing basics for quilters. Now, pressing is something that everyone who sews does, but for quilters, it really is something that we do after almost every seam, and there are lots of little seams when you're quilting. So let's talk about how to make it a little more streamlined and easier. So the first thing when we're talking about pressing, obviously, is choosing a good iron that's going to work for you. So you can see I have three irons here, and I don't like any of them. So let me go over why I don't like them and what do I wish I had. So the first thing you want to think about, believe it or not, is weight. You want an iron that's heavy enough that's going to help you get those seams flat, but not so heavy that you're going to hate using it. The shape of the plate is important too. So you can see that both of these are kind of chubby and I do wish I had a really pointy iron that could really get into those seams, you know, without my having to manipulate them too much. Now there is a lot of talk about what's better in terms of steam distribution, whether it's a lot of holes, little holes, big holes, you know, channels like this one has. Um, if you look at the professional irons, and this is a um, pressing system, you can see that they only have a few holes on the tip. So I really don't notice a big difference in terms of where the holes are and how many holes there are, but it is important that it has a good steam output. Um, also a big tank, and I do like to see a clear tank so I know where my water is. A few other things like, you know, especially if you're left-handed, and I am, does the cord, can you get the cord out of the way? Because that's a big deal for me with this one, because this hot water and steam um, tubes do get hot and I burn my wrist all the time. Also, it's nice to have a retractable cord for storage purposes. Those are all nice things to have. Um, One more feature that I think is very important is the auto shut off. Now, most irons, most regular irons come with that feature and it is of course a safety issue and it's very useful, but honestly, it is really annoying when you're sewing and pressing and coming back to your iron and finding it that it's cooled off in between your pressing. Um, so I wish I had one where I could turn it off. There are irons for under $20 and there are, you know, pressing systems that are over $1,000. So there's definitely a lot to choose. And I think the best thing you can do is read a lot of reviews online before you make the investment. So as we said, when we're quilting, we're pressing our seams almost as we sew them. So it helps to have a mat, a pressing mat, instead of an ironing board where you have to go and get up every time. Um, so a small pressing mat that fits next to you, next to your sewing machine, so you don't have to get up every time. It's a very useful, I would say an essential tool to have. And, you know, Madame Sew's new wool pressing mat is amazing. It really is the best I've ever had. Um, so the wool does a number of things when you're pressing. One, it warms up and it absorbs the steam. So you can actually press at a lower temperature. You don't need to have it um, very, as hot as you normally would and you can use a lot less steam, which is good for not burning your fingers. Um, also, the mat grips your fabric, so it minimizes distortion of your blocks. You know, it reflects the heat back up, so you're basically pressing both sides at the same time. You only need to do one pressing and you're getting it, everything done at once. Um, so it really, really is a wonderful tool to have. Now, one thing to know is that um, the steam does go through, so you need to protect the surface that you are working on, that you have it on. Uh, in my case, I have my old, my old pressing mat, which has a silicone backing. Um, but you know, you can have like a baking mat, those silicone baking mats that's big enough and that will protect your surface very nicely. Now, a few other things that you need on your setup to make it faster are, I have them here and I have them all, you know, in this little box so I can just grab it and use it as I need it. First of all, I have a bottle of water <laughs> with a little funnel. And this is just plain water and it's to refill my iron whenever I need. So I don't have to be leaving my station to go do that. Next, I have my linen water that I make using three parts water, one part ethanol. And I use cheap vodka for that um, and a few drops of lavender oil um, and starch. You know, you need some starch when you're quilting. It really is essential. We're going to talk a little, bit, a little bit more about that. But this is for me an essential tool to have. And then I have 
my trusty chopstick to hold those um, seams open without burning myself. And I also have a silicone fingertip that also helps with avoiding burns. And then just a rag to, you know, clear up any spills that inevitably happen when I'm refilling the iron. This is a pressing mitt. And this you won't use very often with quilting, but I like, I really find it very useful if I'm making things like pouches with piece tops that you can't really set flat on your mat. You know, it's good to have something that you can slide in to do that final pressing. And then an extra tool that I like, especially for certain blocks, and we'll talk about that, is a clapper. You know, this is actually a point and clapper. A regular clapper just has this bottom part without the top, and it's just used for clapping those seams down, especially the ones that are unruly or where you have a lot of layers of fabric. All right, so why do I love starch so much? Because it really helps you st stabilize your fabric before you even cut it. And then it keeps it from distorting after you've cut it and you're sewing seams. You know, very often when you're cutting, when you're piecing for blocks, your fabric is gonna be off grain. So those edges are pretty delicate and they can distort. And if, then if they distort, they'll be too big, too small. And that will affect the final size of your block and how your seams meet together. So I think that starch is essential to keep those distortions to the very minimum. And I just want to show you, these are two pieces of the same fabric. This one is obviously not pressed yet and not um, starched. So just see how it drapes. And now look at the one that's been starched. You know, see how it's much stiffer? It prevents fraying, so it's really a nice thing to do. So how do we do this? Make sure your iron is hot and set it to dry. Okay, you don't want steam for this. Now set your fabric on your mat. Give your starch a good shake. And you're going to give it a light spray, okay? You don't want like big pools of white starch on, on your fabric because then they'll flake. If, if they flake, it's not a big deal. It'll come off, you can just you know brush it off. And now let it sink in. Okay, you want it to really get wet. You don't want to hit it with a hot iron right away because then it will just you know evaporate and it won't be as effective. So let it sink in for you know a few seconds, count to 10, and then turn it to the other side. And now you're gonna heat it with your hot iron. And again, remember you're pressing and you just continue until it's completely dry. Sometimes you need to deal with some stubborn wrinkles, but they'll disappear. So you just continue and you move it around as you go so that you can cover everything. Make sure that it's damp. If not, just turn it over and give it another light spray. And when you're done, you'll have a nice piece of fabric that is ready to be cut. So of course, that's the small mat is very useful for small cuts of fabric, like fat quarters or pre-cuts. Uh, but what do you do when you have you know, yardage that you need to deal with. So the first thing you need to know is that you don't need to unfold the whole thing and press it all at once. You can just done small, small pieces of it. And, you know, if you don't have a large-ish uh, pressing mat, you may need to go to your ironing board for this part. But we try to minimize that. So what I do is I unfold some of it, try to smooth it out, make sure that my fold is nice and even and not ripply because that's what's telling me that it's on grain. Give it a preliminary press with some steam and then I would just turn off the steam um, and I would just start it like a smaller piece. So first thing we need to do when we're going to press our seams is to set them which simply means, you know, this just came off the sewing machine and I am just going to lay it on my mat and press it down with some steam. And that is just going to help that thread that we just sewed sink into the fibers of the fabric and make a nicer seam. Now I let it cool a little bit and I'm actually going to demonstrate with this long strip. The typical way to press your blocks is to press both seams to the same side. You know, we tend, in quilting, we tend not to press seams open because it's a weaker seam. And also, you know, if this seam were to be open, you know, when we're quilting, we're applying a lot of pressure, you know, on it. And 
you know, whether we like it or not, that would be a spot where the batting could actually start coming off over time. So it's usually a stronger seam if we press them both to one side. But which side? Well, generally the darker or busier one. You know, when we're quilting, we're always looking for contrast between our pieces. So we often have a lighter color or less busy print next to a darker or busier print or both. After we've set it, we put the darker color up and then we just pry it open and gently separate them. Finger press carefully. And now I notice that I'm lifting my iron and just bringing it down on that seam. So there it is. It's nice and flat. Let's turn it over so you can see. So it's a nice flat seam, nice and straight. And this is going to have the exact measurement that I need. Okay, so the reason why we do our seams in opposite directions is so that when we're joining rows together, like we did in this nine patch block, things fall into the right spot. We don't have too much bulk on the same side and also so that our corners meet neatly. Okay, so let's turn it over. And here I did all my seams are towards the darker fabric. And what happens when you're joining these rows together, because we're alternating light and dark, light and dark. What we're going to do is nest them. So here you can see they're pointing in opposite directions and there is a little ridge here and we're going to push those ridges against each other. They're not on top of each other. They're just meeting right next to each other. And this could be actually a large quilt. I could have, you know, larger patches here instead of these mini ones. And I would just take a pin and stick it right into that seam, right where they those two ridges meet and I would do this at every seam. Wherever those seams are meeting, I would nest them and pin them and then bring them to the machine. So now we would just set our seam. Don't forget to do that. It really does make a difference. Now I let it cool off a little bit. And now we need to decide, you know, now we have dark and light and how do we decide which is the dark side? So you just look at your patches and you see where you have more dark. So here I have two light patches. So there is more dark here. So I'm going to press towards this side. I bring the dark side on top. Now I gently get it started with my fingers. And now I press it down and I am going to use my chopstick so I don't burn my fingers. And see how nicely those corners meet. Let's talk about blocks that are a little more complicated that have more seams or seams that are uneven or you know points that meet in the center or a centerpiece that you want to highlight. So I have a crazy lock cup in here where I did a pieced center and then you know I just added the, the regular parts of the block. So here this is where you know, you really go from the machine to the ironing mat and the machine to the ironing mat. Because when I was piecing this together, I just did every seam, pressed it, next seam, pressed it, next seam, pressed it. Okay, until I had the whole thing, um, the whole center done. And then I started adding my blocks. Now, one thing I want you to notice here is they are all towards the busier or darker print. You can see it here. But I want you to notice how different these two blocks look. So there is a centerpiece in both of them. But in this one, the seams are pressed toward the outside. You can see how they are all pointing. The centerpiece is flat and all the seams are pointing to the, towards the outside. And here I did the opposite thing. Seams towards the center, seams towards the outside. Now look carefully at how different the effect is. Okay, here the center seems to be sunk and it's surrounded by it and here it stands out. You know, it really is more prominent. And then of course when you quill things might 
you know, change and look a little different, but it is something to take into account when you're pressing your seams. Try to think about the effect you want to achieve and what you want to be more prominent. Good when you have blocks with lots of seams meeting together at the center, things get a little more complicated. My preference is to press all the seams in a circle. So they go in a spiral. Um, and there are several reasons for these. One, it's, it's a little easier to do. You know, you can just go with your iron um, in a smooth movement. And secondly, on the front, you're avoiding any ridges. If I had put this block together with the seam here, let's say this was my last seam, um, there would be a ridge here if the seams were all to, towards one side. Um, so I like, I don't want any part of this block to be more prominent than others. And we talked about that with the when we talked about these two blocks. And then the other thing to take in con into consideration is the center. You know, there is a lot of bulk in that little center. And my preference is to press it open like this. And this may require some spray and maybe even some steam. And this is, you know, one of those instances where, you know, having a clapper would help because it really is, it's a lot of bulk and you have a tiny little seam allowance there that you want to get under control. Now, the one thing you need to think about when you do that, you are actually leaving a very tiny hole, okay? It is there, you don't usually don't see it, but it is there. And you know, as we were saying that we don't, we tend not to press our seams open if we can avoid it, we try not to leave anything open, even if it's a tiny, tiny hole like that, you know. But, you know, sometimes other considerations take precedence and I prefer to do it this way. I think it gives me a flatter center. And the last thing I want to show you is how to correct mistakes. So you can see that the edges of my strips don't meet here. And I know that that means that this seam is inaccurate. So let me just bring my ruler. See how it is curved? There is a gap right here in the middle and it's actually fairly significant. It doesn't seem like it, but if I was joining this to a number of other strips, it would distort the final quilt. My, my, the size of my strips would not be correct and you know that compounds over um, a number. So my seam is set, but I am going to spray it. Get it nice and wet. And now I'm going to coax it against my ruler. And then I'll have to trim that edge. There's nothing I can do about that. I'll have to just trim the part that is prominent, but I can actually fix this. And now very carefully, again, we're just pressing. I really don't want to distort this straight line that I just made. I want to make sure that it's totally dry before I move it. And there it is. Now it's a perfect seam again. Thank you for watching. I hope this was useful and you picked up some new tips that will come in handy. And as always, if you have any questions, let us know in the comments and do follow us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube.